Okay, hello there. Uh, my name is Liam Duffy. I'm an, an advisor for the Counter Extremism Project, which is an international policy organization you probably know, uh, with offices in New York, in Brussels, uh, Berlin, and London, where I am based. Um, as you can probably see, I'm in broadcasting live from my childhood bedroom, which is very cramped, and I've put a bed up against the wall so I can fit a computer in here and talk to you. Um, delighted uh, to have Robert McLean Wilson uh, talking to me today, who is a journalist, uh, an author and novelist. He's written three novels, I think. Uh, the most recent was uh, Eureka Street. Um, I think, uh, Robert, you first came onto my radar a few years ago for something that you wrote in The Guardian or The Observer, but we'll come to that in a bit. Um, the reason that we're going to talk today is some writing that you did um, more recently, um, particularly, I think, probably reached Anglophone audiences a bit more in The Observer. Um, you wrote a piece that got a, quite a bit of traction and uh, I don't know, maybe I'm a bit desensitized, but a lot, you know, I ha happen to read a lot about this subject and things maybe don't tend to move me that much. Um, but your, I have to say that article you wrote in The Observer, which I'll I'll post the link to online and everything, it was just <coughs> honestly uh, one of the most moving and heartbreaking pieces that I've actually read on this topic. And I think one of the reasons for that is it's so hard to capture you know, it's so hard to capture the horror of some of these events when you're through writing, but I think um, you got close to doing so, which I know is an impossible task, but you got close to doing so, uh, even though you're very modest about it. So um, that article was about the attack in Nice on Bastille Day in 2016. So um, Robert, if I've missed anything in the introduction to you, um, can you fill in the gaps, but also um, be great to hear you just give us uh, a bit of an overview of what actually happened uh, in Nice. What? Well as you say, it was um, 2016, um, Bastille Day, 14th of, of July. Um, this had followed 2015, which had been a difficult year um, in France because of terrorist attacks. The Charlie Hebdo attacks, in which um, all told uh, 12 people were murdered. Um, and the, the Ipa Cacher supermarket, that was in January. Then the Bataclan and the terraces of the restaurants and the football stadium in November. I'm so sorry, that just uh, that just lost you there. I'm going to have okay. to ask that, ask that one again. Okay. Um, sorry about that. I don't know what's going on. Maybe I don't know if your connection's being routed around the world to protect. No, no, it should be on uh, just my, my, yeah, yeah, it's no Charlie link here. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, if you could just, uh, sorry about that. We lost the connection for a moment. If you could just give us a quick, um, a quick reminder of what actually went down in Nice in 2016 and why this has been a feature of your writing. After the, the very bad year of 2015, when there was the Charlie Hebdo attacks in January and then the terrible um, Bataclan and, and restaurant attacks in November, there'd been a slight pause in, in perceived terrorist activity, but on, on July 14th of that year at a, at a fireworks show on the on the beachfront, the promenade at Nice, a guy um, who had hired a, a 19 ton truck uh, drove it at speed into a crowd, which probably numbered around 30,000. And before it stopped, he killed 86 people, including 15 children, and wounded probably around 400 people. It was a devastating attack in the sense that it killed more children than 9-11. Um, the, the, the largest, I, I suppose, emotional or moral feature was the number of children killed and their ages. Some of them were very, very young indeed. Um, and yet, a month later, I was writing in Charlie Hebdo that everyone seemed to have forgotten about it. It was absolutely extraordinary. It wasn't anywhere in the press like three weeks later. Mm. So that's yeah. I mean that eighty six people. I mean obviously it's, we're not we're not competing here, but that is just a, a stunning amount. I think second only to uh, to the Bataclan and the, yeah. the, the yeah. twenty fifteen November attacks. Yeah. Um, I think if I'm right in thinking, there was about two hundred and forty people killed in that period in France in about that one year, yeah. one and a half year period, yeah. um, and that's not obviously not including all the all the foiled and disrupted plots by yeah. police as well. Yes. So it was obviously. Uh, a desire to kill many more yeah. um, people than that. So um, before we get more into Nice, like just can you just talk to us about that period? Because I mean, in, in some email correspondence, we talked about that period as like a deliberate offensive against France and a, a deliberate 
attempt to destabilize it and to undermine the social contract? It, I mean, I come from Belfast, where there was a long-term, low-level, basically civil war for 30 years. And you can only sustain a certain kind of death toll if it's going to last that long. So all told, 3,500 people died. And if you average that out over the 30 years, it's not acceptable, but it's kind of livable. And what was happening in, in France at that time was the opposite. These people were going to the absolute extreme straight away. It was zero to 60 in half a second. The, the Charlie, it had started with Ahmed Mecha in 2011 or 12, when he'd um, killed some soldiers, wandered around the country shooting people, and then went into a Jewish school and killed some children there, including pulling a 12-year-old girl up by her hair and shooting her in the head, which, you know, is extreme, is, again, that gesture of, look at us, we're the worst. Charlie was a shock, a massive shock. And actually, in a strange way, a shock that hit children quite hard because it was about cartoonists and what what does what do small children's educations involve? Drawing all the time, um, and a lot of people had had very kind of sentimental relationships with some of the more famous Charlie cartoonists, like um, Cabu. They'd grown up with him. He used to have a, a TV show for kids, and so you know. Uh, five days later, you had seven million people in the streets around France. A week later, they sold an issue that sold eight million. Obviously, that kind of reaction is unsustainable, and it it frittered away. And then the Bataclan was literally about cruelty. It it had no it, when there is what people call political violence usually you can make an effort at least to try and see some political content. But this had none of that. They attacked a football match, restaurants, and a concert hall. So literally they were attacking fun. They were attacking uh, people's pastimes. And they were attacking young people. They were attacking racially mixed people. There were a lot of black and Arab people killed that night. And... People reacted very badly to it because there seemed no rhyme or reason, apart from atavism, apart from barbarism. Look at us. We love death more than you love life. Look at we, what we can do. And I, I thought that France went into like a six-month depression after that. And I think people thought that was the worst. And the, there was a lot of emoting around it. There was a lot of honoring of the dead. And then... Basically, six months later, Nice happens, and Nice is impossible. And Nice isn't impossible because of the numbers. I think really Nice is impossible because of the children. There was a two and a half girl, two and a half year old girl killed. There were two seven year olds, two eight year olds, and they were they weren't killed; they were destroyed. Imagine what a nineteen ton trunk truck does to you if it's if it's doing forty. Or 45 miles an hour. You're, some people were nearly atomized. One woman was cut in two. It, it was a horror that was unthinkable. So, of course, people didn't think about it. Mm. So I, I, I think I wrote in a piece a couple of years ago that um, the response to Charlie Hebdo was one of defiance. We had the, the Republican marches. And then I agree with you. Like I think I used the word despair after the Bataclan. Like, yeah. It was just... Uh, yeah, you use the word depression. It just sunk everyone into a six-month depression. But then, this this atrocity in Nice doesn't seem to have had that cultural impact in the same way. Um, obviously, you've part of that reason you think is to do with the the, the death toll among children. Yeah. Um, I think in your writing on it, you also identified some more like cultural reasons in France for why that might be as well. The French are very contemptuous of Nice. In fact, that whole Côte d'Azur. Uh, if you take the train from Marseille to, to Nice, you pass Toulon, um, Cannes, Antibes, and then Nice. And those, that's a list of, of um, towns and cities that the French despise, that Parisians perhaps despise. 
And it's odd because Marseille, which is quite a reactionary, difficult town, is exempted from this contempt. I'm not sure why. Um, but perhaps because it's too racially mixed and traditionally left-wing people can't go about despising um, an, an area that, that has that kind of demographic. But they believe that Nice is all white, which is massively untrue. I saw many more mixed couples in Nice than I do in Paris. I was there and, recently, and that's definitely not an accurate reflection. Yeah, my God, it's insane. Mm. Um, and I, I find that even in, in the the surroundings of Nice, even in the Ariel um, Villon, the, so you're you're 10 kilometers outside Nice, and you're basically what's a little village, and half the people in the main local bar are black or Arab, and it seemed to be going fine. But pa Parisians think of them as, as reactionaries, like like well, a supercharged Eastbourne, yeah. yeah. You know. I was I was gonna say maybe for uh, like an Anglo American audience, which I imagine most people who watch this would be, is that kind of comparable to you know, like a, a kind of metropolitan London disdain for like the Kent coast, the Essex yeah. or uh, you know, like the, the coastal elite in America might view the rust belt or florida yeah. or something like that is it is it that kind of sentiment I, I i think in in britain and the us it's literally the opposites for britain it's the north that they mm. despise mm. and for the us it's the south basically or the middle mm. or basically anyone who's not the flyover north. states yeah, yeah yeah um and and i think that <clears throat> the the general parisian view of the south is that it's scotland with sunshine you know, they're all boozer, they're all yokels, mm. and they're all right wing, mm. even the ones who are not right wing are right wing. And there is a political thing that there that it's hard for Parisians to thread, which is there's a lot of old communists who now vote um Front National, uh, Rassemblement National. And that for us is also very hard to understand as a Brit or an American. And I, I, I think that ex-communist voting for the far right is a better perception that the French left hasn't failed. The French left has disappeared. The mm. PS, the, the Socialist Party, is a kind of national joke now, both for right and left. So kind of uh, labor type voters or Democrat type voters or, or people more seriously left wing, they don't have a natural home. Mm. And they, I think they think that um there's been a contempt for the working class shown by the French left for good grief, 30 or 40 years now. Mm. And the only people now who at least uh, talk the talk when it comes to uh, working class rights are actually some of the far right parties. Mm. And it's very, they make it very linked to color. Mm. We're talking to the white working class which is a, a pity as that form of class politics, when it's applied correctly, essentially solves all problems of racism as well. If you are um, disfavored or dispossessed, it doesn't matter what color or religion you are, you're my brother, you're my sister. That's gone. That mm. part of left discourse is dead in the water. Mm. So kind of following patterns in Anglo-American yeah. world as well, like the... Yeah. It's kind of seen that the center left parties are like a professional managerial class yeah. appeal rather than the traditional yeah. working class. And I mean, we saw a massive working class turnout for the conservative party in Britain, yeah. which would have been unthinkable a few decades ago, even. And then obviously Trump is the analogy and, and well, Brexit, Trump and then populist appeal in continental Europe all seem to be happening at more or less the same time as well. Yeah, it reminds me of Millwall fans, the, the English football team Millwall, mm. um, which was always a kind of slightly despised team. It was always quite a tough, um, yeah, really tough. I used to team. live about a quarter of a mile from the stadium. Right. So, yeah, okay, so you well. know the story. And they used to sing, everyone hates us and we don't care. Mm. That was one of their, their chants. And some of this working class vote change <coughs> is, is the same thing. It's people... Yeah being defiant in the face of what people aren't stupid. They, they can recognize contempt or disdain mm. when they see it. And the working class globally in Britain is disdained. The working class in America, I mean, the only 
racial epithet you can now use that's tolerable is white trash. Mm. And it's an extraordinary thing to say about people. Mm. Absolutely extraordinary. Redneck is now a compliment in comparison. Mm. So what do people do when they feel disdained? They, they rebel, they revolt, they mm. defy. Of course they do. Mm. They go, I like people who like me. Since I've been working at Charlie, I've had a, I've had a rule in my head. Everybody who doesn't want to kill me is kind of my friend. I really like people who don't want to kill Nothing me. Nothing like working at Charlie Hebdo to put that in perspective. I guess. Yeah, they're nice. People who don't want to kill you are brilliant. <laughs> and then you grade that down from people who don't despise you, people who don't remove your rights or neglect your needs. That's, that's It's natural. It's human. So let, let's get back to Nisa. So you, obviously, I mentioned the... Um, the article that got, uh, from what I could see on social media, got quite a good response um, in the Observer. But also, in addition to that, you did a series of columns in Charlie Hebdo from yeah. from the trial, um, which now, um, again, I'll put a link to this online. But your has now been published as a book, um, yeah. I believe. Uh, I'm going to butcher eighty the pages, quite a quite a small book, <laughs> <laughs> a book Between. nonetheless. But I'm, yeah. I'm going to butcher the pr pronunciation. But it's uh, La Vilaine Verve. Is that right? Wow. Yeah, that's excellent. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Well done. Uh, which roughly translates as, uh, you can see me looking at my notes here, uh, which roughly translates as the ugly widow. So yeah. this gets to what you're talking about, that this this attack is not, didn't make the same cultural yeah. imprint in people's kind of collective memory. So, um, yeah, I mean, guess, I guess talk to us about that. What what on day one of the trial you you got there and there wasn't, I mean, because a lot of these trials were happening at the same time, weren't they? There was Charlie Hebdo trial were happening around the same time. The Bataclan trials were happening. These have all happened in a short space of time. It's in been a, a lot sequence, of attention yeah. on yeah. the former rather than yeah. on Nice. You talk us through, well, yeah, your immediate reactions to this trial. Well, I, I called it La Vilaine Veuve because I, in The Guardian I'd written that it was the wallflower of mm. terrorist attacks. It was neglected compared to the others. And there's no good French for wallflowers. So the ugly widow seemed like a good substitute. Uh, the French justice system has been a, like a, this a massive Henry Ford factory for the last three years, where it's been going through these giant um, trials. In, in the Nice trial, there were 4,500 plaintiffs. In the Bataclan trial, I think there were 5,000. The court um transcript document reached a million pages i mean these are enormous mm -hmm. um processes to get through and that tires people out of course it does the first few days i i turned up at the trial i didn't go to the press room i went to the public room where anyone can go i'm um, sorry my cats are, are <laughs> going <That's nice>. okay. <laughs> um and there were five, six, seven people in, in the public room mm. uh, for this enormous trial. But then I, you can't complain about Parisians because about a month later I was in Nice and I went to the public room where it was being broadcast. And there were six or seven people there as well. I mean, it wasn't just about contempt for Nice. It was about weariness with the subject um, and, and perhaps something... There's something so primal uh, about Nice as well. In all these, these exercises in horror, it's not even terrorism, it's horrorism. Nice, it's, it's a firework display. Who goes to fireworks? Children, families. Yeah. yeah. He, I, I, I saw the part of the video where you see him turning the wheel because he sees a bunch of prams. I saw the part of the video where you see him turning towards the absolute prime target, which was a a stand de bonbon, a, a, a sweet stand, a, a sweetie um, um, the stall. Mm. So, of course, surrounded by children. And I mean, it's it's it's, it's like Nice is actually like a like an evocation of what. As soon as people have a baby. They start fantasizing about the worst case scenario. What if this happens? What if that happens? So Nice is like a like a, a rehearsal of that. You turn around suddenly in the midst of normal life, and that child is gone. Mm -hmm. And it, 
people can't bear it. They can't bear it at all. And for that to come at the end, you, you know, pity has a hierarchy, of course. And we only have a, a certain amount of empathy that's readily available because we have lives, we have our own families, we have our own things to deal with. And for that worst thing to come at the end was, in a sense, catastrophic for, for you know, the, the accumulation of public empathy for the victims. I mean, everyone kind of casually says, oh, yes, that's terrible. But my wife went to a kiosk yesterday to get a co copy of that little book, La Ville en Veuve, and the kiosk guy said, well, the, the Nice trial hasn't even happened yet. So... Mm. You know. And that wouldn't be said about the Bataclan or the no. Charlie trial. No. no, 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 not so at what, all. What you just described, um, yeah, sorry, I, know, I don't want to get too much into the grisly details, but what you just described about people, you know, losing their children, you know, that happens to a lot of people, right? A lot of people lost their only children or some people had their entire families obliterated yeah. in this attack. Is that right? Uh, there was one guy, Christoph, tough kind of rugby guy. Um, ex-soldier, mm. he lost six members of his family in about 15 seconds. Mm. Uh, two of them died, well, four of them died in 15 seconds, two of them died within the hour. And he was, he went into soldier mode and was trying to check their vitals. And as he was checking the vitals of his mother, he was, ah, he was just about still alive. He saw people robbing the the corpses of the rest of his family. He saw people stealing from them. Well, you mentioned uh, Christoph, uh, his family. Uh, he he lost four four instantly and two within an yeah. hour or so. And uh, he had literally just turned around and as as this capable, very physical guy, he was in the mode of you know do something, but it's too quick. It's too impossible but he's not frozen in place he goes he checks everyone and uh he knows immediately that the four of them are dead and but as he's checking on his mother and father he's watching people rob the corpses of the rest of his family because that started happening within two or three minutes yeah can you can you so that that little detail yeah i Ooh. I read that in your reporting. I, I, I can't wrap my head around that. Having, yeah. having been to Nice, having been to a, a visited a lot of France, like, and yeah, I don't know what I don't even know what I want to ask you. I, can't, I cannot yeah. wrap my head around that happening in that instant. Can you? Did you learn anything about why and how that yeah. happened in Israel? Of course I did. Uh, it's a very uncomfortable story that's now very difficult to track down, even despite the fact that. Um, Nice Matin, the local paper, reported on um, the arrests and a couple of trials of people involved in that. Uh, it's, how, how should I put this? It's an uncomfortable story because of the, of the demographic. And in a sense, I understand that. Uh, you don't want to fuel um, hatred or racism. Mm. But a, a total blackout on that is lying i mean you're basically you're basically not telling the truth mm. so uh it was an attack in which 30 percent of the victims were black or arab that was never really mise en valeur as the french say it was never really uh made prominent and the only people during the trial who really went ripped on on the people stealing or taking photographs were the the black and arab people who thought it was fucking disgusting and they were all you know scumbags and white boys mm. uh, because they felt that they had the right to mm. to speak like that uh, christophe did call them um enculé you know assholes uh, but people were very restrained and and as i said some of that is admirable but it's also an untruth I mean, it was mm. pretty much 100%. All of the witnesses and victims who are still alive saw it happen. Mm. It wasn't just on one bit of the promenade. It was the whole way along. You know, people went on the rob. You know, and I, I come from 
I come from a very working class area in, in Belfast, and I know that that is not color coded. I mean, that that kind of predatory rapidity is a is a bad lad feature. It's a bad lad feature in Northern Ireland, in Colombia, in France. It's kind of the same everywhere. Mm. But, but just people, in that instance, it happened yeah, to be yeah, yeah. people of migrant backgrounds, yeah. and then that that kind of, yeah. I guess, for for one of a better word, that kind of white liberal guilt yeah. kicks in, and people don't want to. Yeah, it's an uncomfortable truth. And also, say say some journalist decides to do a, a an expose or a piece about it, they're gonna they're gonna be worried about being called racist, of course. Um, and you need. You need to have a whole big packet of goodwill or an extremely good identitarian credit card yourself. Mm. I'm working class, I'm foreign, here's my, you know, that'll do nicely. Mm. And, and a little bit because I'm a, I'm a working class Mick, I'm Irish, I'm kind of outside that. So I can perhaps say more and, and not be attacked than, than, than other people. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I like I'd read a lot about Nice, and I did not know that detail. I think yeah. until I read your writing. Yeah. Um, and I, speaking of that, you mentioned this. So um, when I did visit Nice, I saw the plaque on the Promenade des Anglais pour, for the victims. Um, and I, I, again, I knew this from the time, but it didn't really register until I saw the plaque and saw the names. Just how many, you know, like North African origin yeah. names there are yeah. on that plaque. Um, you know, this wasn't. This wasn't you know then an attack that people might think of you know on on you know white french people oh, there was yeah. there were tourists from other countries yes. there as well lots um so and yeah it and it's 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 not just the percentages it's not a numbers game but but um black and arab origin people were extremely unlucky when it came to the children the largest part of the youngest children were from that community. Um, you know, and there was one guy who lost, the guy who lost his little two and a half year old, he lost his nephew and his mother at the same time, and his nephew was only seven. I mean, they got very, very unlucky. I mean, I, the thing about it, people talk about Nice being full of rich people and reactionaries, but they're not going to go to a free firework display. Mm. It's going to be the working class. Mm. You know, oh, there's plenty of uh, there's plenty free. of projects at Banlu in Nice yeah, yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there are plenty of working class people like there are everywhere. Mm. You know, Arl is now seen as you know the Vincent van Gogh city, the 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 coming place. It costs a Left lot to rough live around there. The edges, yeah, but Arl's got plenty of serious working class neighborhoods. I know them well. Mm. Everywhere has working class neighborhoods because you can't have a city without someone to clean the streets and empty the bins. Mm. and you know serve the coffee and and actually on nice nice was actually one of the places that was affected quite badly by islamic state departures um people heading to syria um is that did that come up in the trial at all uh not not really Be because uh, uh, again one of the features of nice is you have to ask yourself how islamicist was it I mean, the guy, I'm never going to name the guy who killed those people. I call him Momo. Mm. That's my name for him. Momo was no kind of Islamicist. Momo hated Arabs. Mm -hmm. Momo used to pretend to be Jewish to try and pick up women or, or men um, or Brazilian or something. He, he was filled with loathing for Arabs, as were his mates. They used to swap texts about what dickheads Tunisians were uh, while being Tunisian or Moroccan. Mm. Um, uh, and uh, this this was the biggest example in a sense of franchise terrorism because he had no links at all with al qaeda al qaeda or isis so this is the idea of mcdonald's the mcdonald's in in your local town isn't mcdonald's it's a local business person who owns that franchise that name mm. and they follow the precepts of mcdonald's and share the profits with them this was exactly that. This guy latched on to this overarching nonsensical view mm. to express his own nihilism, self-hatred, and objection. I mean, it. the thing about the ISIS 
um, cult of, of, of death and spectacular barbarism is that, it, that it's a very good match for male um, loser kind of incel shitheads are all um, fucked up. They're going to see this as a a route to vindication, a route to significance. And that's what this guy did. Mm. Um, of course, it was targeted. It was targeted at white people. It was targeted at black people who he didn't like at all either. Um, but, you know, he, I, I, I'm a better Muslim than this guy was. He was a joke. Mm. And so that political content of it is very, very hard to assess, to be honest. It doesn't, it doesn't change the fact that this was an Islamicist inspired attack. This guy would have done something bad. This mm. guy was the masculine principle writ large, incredibly stupid and incredibly arrogant. And that mix makes you toxic and dangerous. He would have done something. But normally he would have, I don't know, killed his wife, maybe mm. his children. In that in that surge of of testosterone mm. yeah um no i was gonna say but there's something about the martyrdom package there where like um you know if you are a delinquent like mohammed marat was for example or yeah. if you are a petty criminal um you can kind of i i, I think a mistake that i think has been made is people think that you know this this whole movement is just one of delinquents and petty criminals and stuff like that but actually that ignores the redemption angle there where yeah you know, you can you can be like this, and the ISIS or Al Qaeda before them, their message is actually if you go and if you go and commit an attack and get yourself killed in the process, you all of that all of that that came before is completely redeemed. The slate is wiped clean. Um, I'm not sure it's that complex. <clears throat> I love the idea of the redemption package. That's very well said, because yeah, it, it, it's packaging, it's marketing, it's. Mm. It's like a computer game. And and most of these guys have an understanding of the world that is on the level of a computer game. Um, I, I've met these guys. I've met these guys in, in, in Belfast. I've met them in, in South America. I've met them here. And they're, there's very, very little cultural difference between them. And the, their principal feature has been, in my experience, award-winning stupidity. I mean, an almost total ignorance of the world by being passionately convinced that they're smarter than you. Uh, and during the Nice trial, uh, during the, the weeks of the accused's testimony, it was notable how they all thought they were the smartest person in the room and they all shot themselves in the foot. They weren't in that much trouble before they opened their mouths. And then they, they just screwed themselves. You could see their lawyers like this rocking back and forward because they were so moronic and yet so confident. Indeed, one, one of them, um, uh, Shokri Shafrud, his, his, his main, seriously, his main um, defense was that he was too stupid. That was it. That was basically what his defense was. I'm too stupid to be guilty of this. Um, so yeah, redemption, I, I don't know, it's uh, Grayeb, who was the principal of the accused, and the day, the morning after the attack, he'd been working in a nearby hotel all night and had been calling Momo uh, 10, 15 times that night, had bought Momo's car the day before uh, mm. to give him money for who knows what. And he walked along where he could at the prom the next day, filming himself like this, you know. And it was quite a disturbing video. Some people found it more disturbing than the the the, the 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 progress of the lorry killing people because people couldn't work out why he was doing it because mm. he wouldn't he didn't dare smile openly. But he was like, mm, I don't know. I knew exactly what he was doing because I you know I'm from the projects. I'm from a housing estate. I knew exactly what he was doing. This is exactly what a white boy shithead thinks is cool. This is cool. This is like defiant. This is a big fuck you to, to the police, to France, to everything. This mm. is just, oh, yeah, this is amazing. Mm. And I think there's quite a lot of that. 
there is there is a redemption package. Mm. I'm not sure there isn't more a significance package. Mm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, I agree with you. But and you you were once a small boy. Yes. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Did you ever play with toy cars? Pretty sure. Okay. Did you drive them around quietly and you know avoiding obstacles? Oh no, it was, ma it was maximum destruction. Yeah, you smash them into things because destruction is a pleasure. Yeah. And I think Nice and the trial and and maybe the Bataclan as well in particular is about that primal masculine joy mm. in mayhem. Mm. It's thrilling. I used to get I used to when I was like 14, I would get into gang battles, one housing estate against the other, and you would go to a field close by the housing estates, run towards each other, and then try to beat the shit out of each other. But mm. we didn't dislike these people, but it was just a good thing to do if you were 14 and full of chemicals, you know, insane. And I remember those with, I remember, it wasn't even pleasure, it was glee. Mm. And the important thing was, it was good if you didn't get much hit, but the important thing was to get a dig in and that people saw it. Mm. You know, you had the bravado of it. Yeah, yeah. There is, yeah, there's, uh, we don't have to spend, spend a lot on this, but the, in my own field, like the terror, I guess, terrorism studies, whatever you want to call it, there's, there is something crucial to understand about the masculine element of these crimes these atrocities that i think is really underserved by yeah. the discourse in inverted yeah. commas because it's it's kind of hijacked by like this kind of campus progressivism that yeah. has come from america if i, if I can say that yeah. but it's you know it's like half-baked theories but there's something real to understand about about because it is as you said you know we, we know that women joined isis and things like that yeah. but you know the the attacks the yeah let's the be violence, real yeah it's is by men yeah almost without exception and also not even that it's very masculine in its essence and mm. um, even more than 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 the bataclan concert hall perhaps the spraying of the terraces at the at the restaurants mm. you're driving along in the shitty little car you stop at a terrace like two of you get out and you, you hose it down mm. it's like it's like um, 12 year olds playing um, with sticks. It's, it's that kind of bravado. It's that kind of enjoyment. Have you ever shot a gun? Mm. You? Have mm -hmm. you? You have? Okay. I remember the, the one, the couple of times I shot a gun, I understood something about ergonomics because I'm very anti gun. I'm very anti violence. I'm violently anti violence. But the gun, is perfect ergonomics. It's mm. not that the gun was made for the hand. It's you feel like the hand was made for the gun. You put that thing in your hand, and there is no way you don't want to squeeze the trigger. It's mm. it's a sensual delight. Mm. It's like some of the finer parts of sport. If you if you hit a cricket shot with perfect timing or or score a half volley from twenty two yards out, it's just about rightness fitness mm. well as i said i've taken up a lot of your time have you got any closing thoughts about i mean it can be we can go right back to the beginning of the conversation before you head off to go have a cigarette uh anything about nice uh that you wanted to add in but like i said i will i will share uh links to your writing and to the published writing of the published book as well well this is actually it's not even about nice it is of course about nice but it's about a note to myself because i used to do this as well every now and then with a with a news story that you instinctively avoid uh whether it's because it's too many people dead or it's too sordid or depressing or it's children read it anyway people deserve to be noticed no no i would i would say and it's what Nice has taught me, but also my own life, because I used to ignore stories about parents murdering their children all the time. I used to ignore the photographs passionately. If there are stories that are sometimes too depressing for you, whether they're, it's too many people killed or it's too sordid or there are children, every now and then read one or pay attention to one because people's passing deserves to be marked and it'll do you good. It really will. 
Uh, thank you. And I, I mean, just to reiterate what I said at the start of the conversation, I think your writing on Nice captured something that I, I couldn't tell you what it was. Sorry to be, use a cliche, but je ne sais quoi. I don't know what it was, but it did capture something that I, I don't think I've read in other writing of that type. So It's because I'm Gandalf. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> But uh, I will do my best to point people towards it as well. Okay. Um, but again, thank you so much for your time. I thought you my know, pleasure. Based my on pleasure. based on your reporting, we just had to talk. So yeah. um, thank you, and uh, apologies to anyone who watches this. Any editing yeah. and interruptions and stuff yeah. that, that are Sorry. obvious and evident, but uh, unavoidable, I'm afraid. Yeah. Thank you again. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Bye.